Uh, so my PhD was entitled uh, Athlete Monitoring, a Holistic Approach to Data Collection and Analysis. And so well, what does that mean? It simply means I was looking at uh, training related data that the athletes were doing, not just on the bike, but in the gym. And then I was uh, collecting metrics that were relating to their mental health and well-being through um, some questionnaire surveys that I was giving them on a regular basis. And I was monitoring fatigue uh, through what we call a counter movement jump test um, with a linear position transducer, which was uh, measuring uh, kinetic and kinematic variables from it that I could monitor to determine uh, whether they were going up or down in response to fatigue that the athletes were carrying. Um, so the jump test is quite common in sports science. We'll tell an athlete to jump as high as they can and we just keep tracking that each week. Uh, and the changes in the height and the power output are reflective of fatigue. There's, there's enough research out there now that says that in general it's quite a sensitive measure yep. to how the athlete is feeling and how much training they're doing. So that's what my PhD was looking at collectively. Okay. And you're mainly focused on endurance athletes or across the board? So for the PhD uh, publications itself, I was focusing on endurance athletes. Yep. Uh, but as part of a, a PhD, you have to produce a steel man argument for why you are choosing to produce some studies in the area that you are. And you do that by having to do a, a quite a large review of the literature and discuss all of it. So I have to discuss that in the context of not just endurance athletes, but what we were seeing in team sport athletes. And I was kind of actually had to do that because the majority of research in the space is actually done on team sport athletes. They're just large samples. They're easy to work with. Um, it's usually a bit easy to get. Uh, more than 20 people involved in those studies. So your data is very sound with, with respect to the type of analytics you're doing on it. Because if you've only got like three people to analyze, it's not reflective of a much larger population. Yep. So as part of the PhD, um, I got to look at research from a lot of different athletes in the space of training load and how athletes are tolerating it and how they're recovering and, and how we measure fatigue in athletes and what's the best way to measure their, their mental health uh, and well-being. Yes. So um, it was quite an interesting and exciting journey for me. I, I loved every second of it. I didn't regret it. Um, and it's probably why I managed to finish it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, what were your biggest, you know, obviously there's a lot of time and energy being put into it, in, into something like that. And you work with the cycling team specifically. So if we could maybe, you know, angle more towards the, the, the learnings from the cycling team, um, but then overall, like what were your biggest takeaways? Because my research with the cycling team was collecting measurements that assessed how fatigued the athletes were, which I was assessing through the counter movement jump, and then mentally, how were they going? So yeah. I had um, a questionnaire, it was called the short recovery stress scale, sort of eight questions pertaining to how the athlete feels physically and how they feel mentally and emotionally. And then I was able to watch the trends and changes in those variables, because I was collecting them twice a week off this team over a season. Uh, in response to their training load that they were doing. So, you know, metrics from, <laughs> so in response to their training load, yeah. uh, using metrics, uh, you, you guys use training stress score, TSS, yeah, is that yeah, correct? Yeah. And I was using distance and time of training. And I, and I pulled all this data off their GPS units basically and tracked that. And so the biggest takeaway that I was noticing was that when the athletes were reporting that they were feeling under-recovered and fatigued and mentally and emotionally not doing so well, mm it was in response to uh, training picking up, and particularly what, what we call acute training load, which is training you've done over the last seven days. As that started to increase, I started to see these fatigue metrics and wellness metrics really start to uh, decrease because the athletes weren't tolerating the training quite as well in that acute period. And so... So, so just pause on that one, yeah. double click. So it did correlate quite nicely with like in today's plan, which they would now be using training peaks, but today's plan is gone with acute training load. So there wasn't like major discrepancies between what you were seeing in the data versus what you were hearing. Yeah, so the, that, that's right. It was, it was almost like, oh, seven day training loads jumped up. Yep. Uh, which I think, is it you guys call the ATL? Yep, in the metric? acute training load. Yep. So that's bumped up. What would happen? Like nine out of 10 times when the athlete then reported their questionnaire, like, I feel not so good, my body's sore, mentally I'm not coping so well, emotionally I'm getting a bit erratic or I'm losing my temper. Yep. Um, and then what I was seeing on the jump test that I was doing, okay, the, that's bottoming out. The athlete's not near their average anymore. There may be one or two standard deviations below their average uh, of the data that I've been collecting. So it was always, uh, I, I could almost just do the jump test mm. and go, without looking at their training load and say, have you ramped up your training in the last seven days? And like, oh yeah, it's been tough. And like, oh, this new training block. So the big takeaway from me with that was like, okay, 
the, reco the recovery and how the athletes felt was a reflection of the training. And if the training is always going to be there, then how do we, how do we tolerate it better? And so the takeaway is we then need like, to really focus on how we recover because mm. I can tell it's detrimental to, detrimental to how you're feeling. So if we can improve the way you recover and tolerate that training, maybe we'll see less detriments in my jump test and my wellness and health and well-being measurements uh, that I was giving. So that was the big takeaway and that was consistent with um, some research uh, that I've looked at over the years. And one, one that's really stuck with me was a research from Brazil, um, Caggiani and his research team in 2019 and 2020. They produced some actually pretty interesting research I felt uh, that I hadn't seen for a long time. And they effectively got a large sample of athletes and they said, okay, well, who has symptoms of overtraining syndrome, which we now call non-functional overreaching, but um, that's the term, it's yes. stuck with us now, yeah? So, uh, and how do they identify those athletes? Well, their performance is stagnated or going down and they have physical, mental health sort of stuff going on. So yeah, those, that group of athletes, and they said, okay, now I need some controls. I need athletes that their performance is going well, they're adapting, they feel pretty good. And then he followed them and collected a ton of metrics. But the metrics that he found that were most predictive of whether an athlete was gonna be overtrained or like symptoms of overtraining syndrome or, hey, I'm a healthy athlete, I'm adapting, was carbohydrate intake, protein intake, and total energy intake. He said they were independent predictors. So that, mean, that means that when he feeds that data into an algorithm, which, which we use a lot in sport, sports science and strength conditioning, when you feed it into an algorithm, if you don't tell the algorithm whether the person belongs to the overtrained group or the healthy athlete group, you can just give the other data, the training behaviors and the eating habits. It went, oh, just based solely on what the person was eating and their carbohydrate and sort of protein intake, it could predict based on those quantities of whether someone should be classified as overtrained or um, healthy and adapting. Mm -hmm. And is there 100% accuracy in the algorithm? No, yeah. but is it significant enough and accurate enough for, for our ears to prick up? Definitely, and that's what Caggiani reported on. So it really highlighted an important thing that athletes need to make sure they're nutritionally supporting what they're doing. And the reason that's an issue is the research highlights at the moment that the vast majority of athletes are not eating enough. I'll, I'll give you guys. This is despite all the information out there is you've got to eat well, not, yeah. nutrition's number one, you've got to carb intake, like people still aren't doing it. <laughs> like, 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 put, like put it this way, you, in, in conversations that you would have had with athletes before and conversations that I've had with athletes, we're all super serious about the bike weight, carbon fiber um, water bottles and carbon fiber soles and got to get the right handlebars and you're trying to get these marginal gains off the bike. Yeah. When aero the, suits, aero, aero helmets, suits, <laughs> you know, aero socks, yeah. Your hydration sh strategies on yeah. the bike and electrolyte mix. But when the, one of the most critical aspects of whether you will perform or not is whether you're eating enough to meet your demands of your training so you're adapting to it and, and leading to long-term performance improvements. And so it's, it's really interesting to me that people put all this time and effort into it. And I'd be on a bunch ride. Oh, I've got this, this, and this. Oh, cool. Have you had breakfast this morning? Just a coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yeah. We're doing six hours today. Yeah. All right. And then, then they're trying to backload their day and play catch up and it just yeah. doesn't work. And, and that's when the bad habits come into play as right. well. Yeah. I think you had a conversation with Steph about backloading. Yes, exactly. Uh, as well. So we know how detrimental that is to performance by trying to play catch up because you never can do it correctly and they're not eating enough. So if we, if we look at the literature of what they're reporting of athlete eating behaviors, it appears that 22 to 58% of athletes are not eating enough to meet their That's daily crazy. Issue. That's a big number. Yeah. And what's concerning is then we, when we look at a subset of female athletes, something came out in the last three years on this, uh, if we just review eating habits of female athletes, elite or pre-elite, 80% are not eating enough to meet that daily energy demands. And so these athletes that aren't eating enough, not only do we have performance decrements, we're not adapting to training, we're increasing our risk of overtraining syndrome. Um, we, we, can, we get this myriad of like physical and psychological health related issues and, and just bouncing between injuries and it gets really nasty. So team, the, the we need to put as much emphasis on recovering as we do training and getting excited about the tech that we're training with. So. It starts with taking food seriously and putting some, I would strongly suggest if you're really interested in about getting better, put some money aside, save up and see a sports dietitian. Uh, they're worth their weight in gold. And then the second most critical element of recovery is sleep. Mm. And I gave a presentation recently. Yes. <laughs> at the University of the Sunshine Coast. 
and I had approximately 80 people in the audience and it was about how to uh, achieve peak performance in sport. Yep. And I had a section on recovery. And I, of my 80 audience members, I said, let's do a survey here real quick. Please raise your hand if you slept eight hours last night. I had six people put their hand up. Wow. I said, okay, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. You might have had a rough night. I said, who on average typically sleeps eight hours per night? Two more hands went up. So of my room, it appeared 10% or less are sleeping eight hours per night. And what was the rough age group? I had uh, actually quite a big spectrum. I had athletes ranging from 13, 14 years of age, like emerging athletes. Wow. Uh, they should be getting uh, 12 uh, hours yeah, of sleep a night. Up to like elite, like national, international level athletes. Yeah. And then uh, like masters athletes and then yeah. parents of those yes. children were there as well. Uh, so quite a big spectrum and I was just shocked. Uh, but I shouldn't have been because what, what the research highlights, um, Brown did a synthesis of this research uh, in 2022, looking at all the sleep behavior research uh, in athletes. And uh, they reported some alarming facts. The first one was that if they, when they collectively looked at the literature, they said you know, approximately 60% of athletes that, whose sleeping behaviors are being reported in the literature are sleeping less than eight hours per night. Now that's concerning for a couple of reasons. It's, it's concerning because chronic sleep deprivation significantly increases risk of cardiac disease and stroke. Mm. So cycling aside, that's concerning. The other reason it's concerning is it leads to temporary but medium to large performance decrements. So if you don't have a good night's sleep and expect to perform the next day, we know you're actually going to be fairly terrible compared to what we know your, your average performance normally is. The other concerning thing um, about that research that Brower produced as well, um, they looked at some research of nearly 20 sporting teams of collegiate age athletes. And they surveyed their sleeping habits and they found that the average sleep duration of that sample, which would have been approximately at least 200 athletes, uh, was 6.7 hours per night. That's an incredibly low average for a representative sample of athletes. So team, we really need to be getting our eight hours sleep. And I don't want to scare you with the numbers of how detrimental one bad night's sleep is on performance, but it is significant. Mm. And the, det the temporary detriment is larger than the performance enhancement you can expect in 12 months on your bike. You can take that to the bank. Wow. So we want to get our eight hours sleep. If you struggle with that, how are we going to do it? Dark room, free of disruptive noise, comfortable temperature. Mm. So you can either do blackout curtains like we've got in the studio here today, yeah. um, or the eye mask that you might have seen some people wearing yeah. to bed, earplugs if you find you have sensitive hearing and get disrupted by it, noise cancelling machine or putting a fan on to drown out some sounds. And then from the comfortable temp temperature perspective- Move the kids out of home. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that would be one for the noise. Um, or, uh, you know, like, depending on what part of the world you live in, does the comfortable temperature mean you need like heating in your bedroom to try and keep it a comfortable temperature or yep. extra blankets on the bed. Or if you live in Queensland like you and I do, making sure in summer we have an air conditioning unit or a pretty good fan going. Uh, and probably the last thing I want to touch then on improving your sleep hygiene, meaning you're getting your eight hours, is making sure one to two hours before bed, like dimming the lights in your house, like turning off your ceiling lights, opting for lamps, and trying to reduce screen time mm. uh, before bed. And the reason is you're trying to reduce the amount of light going in your eyes because in the evening your body's trying to increase melatonin uh, levels and melatonin as it's released from the brain it's trying to like slow your metabolism down and get you tired and go to bed you've got all this light going in your eyes it disrupts melatonin production so your levels aren't optimal and you'll find that you have a delayed onset of sleep but mm. chances are you still have to get up for work or training at the same time so it just means you sleep less yeah and we don't want that yeah so team recovery it has to be taken as seriously as training and the critical aspects of recovery are food and sleep so they were your two biggest takeaways from the PhD. Yep, that we, can, that we can enhance, if we can enhance recovery, we can better tolerate the training loads, yep. which means we'll have less detrimental psychological effects and physical effects, and we will adapt to our training better. Yeah. And did your PhD studies almost shock you? Because those two things like, are quite obvious. They should be to a lot of people. But was it more so the fact that despite how obvious they are, people are still not doing it. Correct. And also yeah. the associated, like how detrimental the impact is by not doing it properly. Yeah, it, it is concerning, but it'd be the pot calling the kettle black if I feel like, please don't think I'm standing on a pedestal with this team. I've also gone through my 
exercise an athlete and, and cycling phase and triathlon, I too was not taking sleep seriously. Mm. I was very good with my food, but my sleep was terrible. I was right. often getting six and a half hours sleep per night because I was trying to wake up early for the bunch ride or a swim squad and then go to work afterwards. So I, even someone who, sh me personally was studying at the same time, should have been more well informed that I wasn't taking it seriously. Interesting. So, so I think it's, we can get um, tunnel vision yes. and, and narrow focus and we just think performance and training, performance and training. Uh, and we forget about these recovery components. But what we learn on the, on the journey and through research and being an athlete is like, it's not sustainable mm. and you can get quite sick and you get quite injured from it. And, and when I say sick, you know, both like mental health issues and physical health issues as well. So team, you know, you probably can do some soul searching yourself and identify the areas where you can improve on. And if you start making an attempt to improve on those areas, I can guarantee you it will benefit you in the long run with respect to performance and longevity in your sport. Yeah, cool. Oh, thanks for sharing. Um, you know, if people are interested in learning how to better, you know, implement recovery strategies into their gym plan, I know you've put some your plans for us together at the RCA, which has incorporated a lot of recovery stuff yep. and, and how to improve from that perspective. Uh, so what have you put together for us? So I put together some modules with respect to strength training yep. uh, for beginners, intermediate, and advanced level trainers. Uh, and the goal of each of those uh, training block programs, they go for many, many weeks, 16 weeks, I believe, for each one. Yep. And the goal is to improve cycling performance. But they're designed in a way so that you recover better after the gym training session due to the intensity sets and reps that I've selected and the recovery modes that I've also put in there in the, in the form of stretching, mobility and foam rolling. So yeah. if you're finding you're hitting a, a dead end with, with respect to incorporating strength training into your cycling training uh, and a bit unsure how to do it while optimizing recovery, that's a really good start for you. So check out the link in the description below. Thanks, mate. Appreciate your time. No worries.